Trisha used a 240 guide to pass her Praxis exams, and she let us know that it was money very well spent. Want to be like her and pass with flying colors? My name is Emma, and I'm a former teacher myself. Along with my 240 team, I've helped thousands of teachers pass their Praxis exams. Are you a teacher or soon-to-be teacher who needs to pass the Praxis? If so, you're in the right place. This video is going to prepare you for the Praxis Principles of Learning and Teaching grades 5 through 9 test. That's number 5623. And this video is going to cover three things. What's on the test and how to study for it, the biggest concepts you need to master, and after that we're going to look at a few practice questions. So who's ready to write their success story? Let's get going and write chapter 1 together. Now this Praxis Principles of Learning and Teaching exam consists of five content categories. Students as learners, instructional process, assessment, professional development, leadership, and community, and analysis of instructional scenarios. The questions for categories one through four are all selected response, and category five asks constructed response questions, which we can call CRQs for short. Selected response are multiple choice, and constructed response are like essays. The selected response questions are worth 75% of the overall score, and the CRQs are worth 25%. Even though they're worth a smaller percentage, thinking about writing essays on your exam might make you nervous, but let me show you something pretty cool. The topics you'll write your essays about match the first four content categories. So the studying you do for the selected response portion will also help you prepare for the CRQs. That's 240 for you. We like to work smarter instead of harder. However, you will want to hear more about those CRQs, including tips for answering them. We'll circle back to that, but for now, let's get into our selected response content categories. Let's take it from the top. Category 1 is worth 22.5% of your overall score, totaling approximately 21 selected response questions in all. You'll see questions about student development and learning, diverse learners, and motivation and the learning environment. So basically, it includes everything you need to know about your students. And you also need to know how to reach all of those teens and preteens in your classroom as an educator. This might seem daunting, but don't worry, we'll go through it piece by piece. And don't forget to stick around because later we'll tackle a few practice questions together. But first, let's look at some topics you're most likely to see in Category 1, starting with student development and learning. In this section, you're going to focus on anything that will help students learn better. An important part of teaching goes beyond the teacher sharing specific content knowledge and focuses on teaching students how to learn. Even though your students will have been in school for at least five years by now, as their brains continue to change and develop, they need continued support on how to use them. Teachers should help students develop metacognition, which is the process of thinking about one's own thinking. I'm thinking about my own thinking now. Hmm, how's my hair? I went with the middle part. Should I have done that? Is it working? <coughs> Oh yeah, about metacognition. There are several different strategies teachers can use to facilitate metacognition, such as activating prior knowledge, using graphic organizers, questioning, and annotating. But the most important thing to know about metacognition is that it helps students recognize how they learn best. While using the strategies, teachers should guide students through thinking about their own thinking. Feeling warmed up? Let's keep going through category one. Next up is working with diverse learners. Students in your classroom will have a variety of diverse needs, and same goes for the types of questions you'll see in this category. Expect questions about English language learners, gifted students, and students receiving 504 or special education services. Want to hear the absolute need to knows for your exam about students receiving special education services? I have an idea for what to talk to you about, and that's IDEA, which stands for the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. IDEA has six main elements, and you can find them all in our study guide. But the most essential one for you to know on the PLT is the IEP. I like that little acrostic we just saw. Let's do that again. IEP stands for Individualized Education Program. This is a plan created by a committee of general and special education teachers, parents, specialists, and administrators to provide a free and appropriate public education that is tailored to a student's needs and goals. IDEA mandates that all students receiving special education services should have an IEP and that all teachers are required to follow them. Did you know interior design would be part of your job as an educator? Really? There are important considerations to make when designing the layout of your classroom. And don't worry, Emma's School of Design is now open. Let's take a peek inside our study guide to see some common arrangements and the instructional formats they best support. Teachers should be mindful that the student seating arrangement works in conjunction with the instructional activity. In other words, different setups lend themselves best to different tasks. 
When listening to any type of presentation, whether it be from the teacher, a guest speaker, or fellow classmates, students should all be able to see. Facing front typically works best. When the whole class is having a discussion, it's helpful for everyone to be seen. When collaborating on a group assignment, it's beneficial for students to sit together. The walkways should be open so the teacher can easily move to check on each group. And when the teacher is working with a small group of students, the rest of the class should still be in view. That was some great information. And if you'd like to see more videos like that as you prepare for your exam, subscribe to a 240 study guide. And the money back guarantee will give you more confidence than bold wallpaper on an accent wall. Before we move on to category two, wanna hear one more tip about creating an effective learning environment? Yeah, I thought you would. While there's a lot to consider when it comes to the physical space of a classroom, safety always comes first. Students should be able to move around the room and access needed materials safely and efficiently. So if you see an answer choice that references making the room a safe space for students, that's usually the right one. Okay, we made it through our first category, but we're just getting warmed up. Let's move on to the other biggest chunk of the selected response portion, category two. It's also worth 22.5% of your overall score. Category two is all about instruction, as in the actual teaching you'll be doing in the classroom. In this category, you'll need to know about planning instruction, instructional strategies, and both questioning and communication techniques. Let's kick off this category by hearing a key concept on planning. Just like most parts of being a teacher, there are many factors to consider when planning instruction. And sometimes even the best plans don't go, well, according to plan. But hey, it happens, and you are a superstar teacher so you can handle it, both in the classroom and when it comes up on this exam. Ask yourself the following, did most of the class greatly struggle? Teach it again, using a different approach. You may also ask yourself whether or not the expectations were clear. Did the students master everything except this one little part? Target it. Again, it's probably a good idea to rethink the approach you took the first go round. Did most of the class demonstrate mastery? Time to move on or bump up the challenge. The most important takeaways here, if students don't grasp a concept, don't just present it in the exact same way a second time. Switch it up. Okay, you've planned and adjusted your instruction. Now, how are you going to deliver it? There are many strategies you can use to deliver quality instruction. Let's discuss one that's bound to come up on your exam. We've established that planning is important, and it definitely is, but some of the most authentic teaching happens when the lesson goes a little off the rails. A teachable moment is an unexpected opportunity to teach something new. Teachers should capitalize on these. A teachable moment may come in the form of a student question, like a student who comes into science class after getting a flu shot and asks how vaccines work. It could also be in response to something else unexpected, like a typo in the heading of a news article that prompts a mini lesson on apostrophes. Teachable moments are powerful because they present authentic learning opportunities that are immediately meaningful and relevant to students. Questioning is such an important strategy to use throughout instruction that it gets its own part of the category. Do you wanna know a great framework to use throughout the instructional process, including questioning? Bloom's Taxonomy. Bloom's Taxonomy is used to classify educational learning objectives into levels of complexity and specificity. The levels are modeled as a pyramid, starting with foundational skills at the base and increasing in rigor as they work their way up that particular skill or concept. When thinking about questioning, answering a question toward the bottom of the pyramid would require basic fact recall, such as what are some resources provided in your community? Whereas higher level thinking is required as you move up the pyramid with a question like, how would you improve your community? Want more practice identifying levels of blooms? We have it covered for you in our study guide. And I've got some good news for you. We've almost made it through category two. So let's finish it out. You'll also see questions about effective communication in the category about instruction. And that makes sense because in the classroom, communication is key. And sometimes communication with this age group is hard. But I have the perfect video for highlighting some of the most important things to know about communication for your exam. In the classroom, communication is key. Communication with students must be clear and specific. Remember, students don't know what they don't know. For the classroom to run smoothly, students must clearly understand expectations and directions. Teachers need to clearly communicate what they want students to do and how the students are supposed to make it happen. Couldn't have said it better myself. How are we feeling? You okay? Little overwhelmed? Well, I have two pieces of good news for you. 
One, we've made it through the bulk of our selected response categories. The next two aren't quite so big and beefy. And two, we have everything you need to gain the confidence you deserve to pass your exam in our study guide. It's self-paced, so you can work through as much or little as you need at a time to feel truly prepared. Plus, have I mentioned it comes with a money-back guarantee? It does. All right, next category, here we come. Category three is all about assessment. It is worth 15% of your overall score, so that totals around 14 selected response questions in all. So yeah, part of your assessment is about assessment. I'm making a video lesson about the lessons in the 240 study guides that help people take a test about tests. Anyway, sorry, where were we? Category three, yes. This category is broken up by evaluation strategies and assessment tools. Let's talk about evaluation strategies first. A big part of this portion is being able to match an objective to an assessment. I'll give you an example. Let's say you need to collect data to prove a student's growth over time. A portfolio is the way to go. This assessment aligns best with the objective because work samples can be collected over time to demonstrate a student's improvement. Let's stay on this assessment train and ride on home. In the assessment tools portion, you'll need to know more assessment terminology. Expect to see vocabulary like percentile rank, standing, formative, summative, norm referenced, and criterion referenced on your exam. Let's dig into these two. Criterion referenced assessments compare student performance to a predetermined standard, which is a criteria. Scores on these types of tests come in the form of a percentage. Tests administered at the end of an instructional unit and state achievement tests are common examples. Norm referenced assessments compare students to each other and rank them according to performance. Scores on these types of tests come in the form of a percentile, grade level equivalency, or standing using a normal bell-shaped curve. Common examples include the Scholastic Aptitude Test, or SAT, and Intelligent Quotient, or IQ tests. To sum this up, Criterion Referenced Assessment looks at how students perform against a set criteria. Norm Referenced Assessment looks at how students perform against the normal curve. And those are some need to knows for Category 3. Want to see more? You know where to find it. One more time for the people in the back. It's in the study guide. We've made it to the last selected response category. Category four covers professional development, leadership, and community, and is worth the same amount of your overall score as category three, at 15%. Here, you'll need to know about collaboration, both with other professionals and students' families. You'll also see questions about improving your practice as a teacher, including specific vocabulary related to professional development. One of the terms to watch for is academic journal. You may love to peruse teaching blogs or chat with fellow educators online, and that's great. But on this exam, resources for professional development should be backed by research. That's why we like academic journals. We've made it through the whole selected response portion. Let's get some confetti. Now, who's ready to write a quick essay? Oh, come on, it'll be fun, I promise. The last category, Analysis of Instructional Scenarios, is the one made up of Constructed Response Questions, or CRQs. Remember that this category makes up 25% of your overall score. I'm going to explain what the questions look like and give you some tips to use when answering them. Plus, we'll look at a sample question and answer it together. You'll be given two case histories, or in-depth scenarios. Each scenario will be followed by two questions for you to answer. Furthermore, each question may have up to two parts. That's kind of a lot under those umbrellas, huh? Don't worry, I've got you covered. After you've read the case history scenario, notice the grade level or ability level of the students. And be sure to note any particular context you're given, such as a certain subject area, parent meeting, or health concern. Your responses can be brief and straight to the point. We recommend writing one or two paragraphs for each question. Oh, and be as specific as possible. Now, let's get into our tips for what exactly to write. There are tons of possibilities for the kinds of questions you'll get or what your case histories will be about. But remember at the beginning of the video when I told you that the topics in the CRQs are the same as the first four content categories? I'm gonna give you a key tip for answering questions about each of those topics. Starting with students as learners. One thing you might be asked about is learning theories. So it's a good idea to review terms related to that, such as metacognition and zone of proximal development. The best responses to questions about this topic are student-centered. Always keep your focus on what's best for the students. Under instructional process, you might get a question about learning objectives. So we recommend you practice writing measurable objectives and review some strategies to directly achieve those objectives. 
If your CRQ is about assessment, it's highly likely that you'll be asked about the different types of assessments, or you'll have to choose which one should be used in the given scenario. Make sure to review formal and informal, summative and formative, diagnostic, criterion referenced, and norm referenced assessments. Assessment is all about data. Top responses in this category point out the specific evidence given in the scenario to support their answer. Finally, something that's likely to come up under professional development, leadership, and community is teachers' reflective practice. Be prepared to write about reflective journals, assessment data, peer observation, and portfolios. Hmm, reflective practice. Let's practice some reflection. Can they tell how tall I am on camera? For all they know, I'm six foot. Ha, <laughs> that would be awesome. Oh, right, now that was only one tip for each topic. We have lots more in the 240 study guide, so you can feel prepared no matter what kind of constructive response question you get. Now let's look at a sample question to put all of these tips into action. Here's the scenario. Okay, so we're talking about eighth grade, and we've got students with IEPs and students scoring below grade level. Now we get some detailed information. Here are the journal prompts the teacher is giving at the beginning of the unit about plate tectonics and topography. The next part of the case study shows us a slide from the lesson, as well as a transcript of a classroom discussion. You can pause to read this, but we recommend just skimming it to familiarize yourself with it. Then, once you read the question, you can go back and look for the specifics that you need to focus on. And last, we get a transcript of a conversation between the teacher and one student in particular. Okay, here's the question we need to answer. We need to choose two components of effective questioning that the teacher used, and we need to explain how these elements help students learn. There's likely more than one correct answer here, but I'm going to show you an example of one strong response. Since we're looking for what Mrs. Glantz did well during questioning, we need to focus on the transcripts of conversations rather than the slide or journal prompts. After looking over the class discussion again, you may notice that when student one answered incorrectly, Mrs. Glantz had a great way of responding. Instead of shutting them down, she responded gently, recognizing their thought process, and smoothly transitioned back to finding the correct answer. That's effective questioning. There's evidence of another component of effective questioning here, wait time. Notice the pauses and how she trails off mid-sentence to let students answer? That's a best practice, especially when working with students with exceptionalities. Okay, we've identified our two components of effective questioning. Let's write our response, making sure to explain why they're effective so we get credit for both parts of the question. Here's the first part of the answer about how she handled the wrong answer. It explains how the technique avoids making students feel bad and encourages their participation next time. And here's the second part about wait time. It gets right to the point and explains how this contributes to student learning. So that's it. Now on your exam, that case study would have a second question to answer too. We don't have time to answer another one together, but the good news is the 240 study guide has even more practice prompts just like this, so you'll have all the practice you need. Now that you've gotten some practice with constructed response questions, let's look at some selected response questions. These practice questions will show you how concepts one through four can appear on the test. And if you want a lot of practice questions, you can click the free practice test in the description. After you see how you did on that test, you'll know exactly what you need to study in the guide. Now for questions. Let's start back at the beginning with students as learners. Here's an example from the development and learning section. Remember metacognition? Which of the following examples would best help students to improve their skills of metacognition? A and B allow students to be creative and have ownership over their learning experience, which are both great ideas, but neither one helps with metacognition, so they're both out. Creating lessons that relate to different learning styles is also a great practice in the classroom, but doesn't require students to think about their own learning, so we can get rid of that one too. Choice D is best. By asking students to think about which strategies would work best with a new assignment, you're asking them to understand how to organize material for their own consumption. While metacognition is important, there's so much more to this section. Luckily, the study guide has it all for you. Next up, diverse learners. Ooh, here's a great example focusing on creating an IEP. Remember, even if you're not a special education teacher, you may spend time on an IEP team for your students. When deciding the least restrictive environment for a student with disabilities, what should the IEP team consider? The best answer is this one. 
In order to create the least restrictive environment for a student, the frequency, location, duration, and intensity of the identified services need to be considered. Let's move on to Category 2, the instructional process. How about a question on strategies? As Ms. Harrigan is teaching about alternatives to fossil fuels, a student speaks up complaining that alternative sources are not a good idea because they cost more. Which response would best lead the class through a learning experience related to this objection? This is a tough one. I can see most of these being used in the classroom, but one answer is definitely best here. In choice A, incorporating the question into a future lesson, Ms. Harrigan not only shows respect for the student who asked the question, but also gives herself time to investigate the question and gives the class an opportunity to make a cost-benefit comparison of alternative fuels. She also takes advantage of a teachable moment, so A is best. Nice! Let's tackle one more from this competency. Ooh, remember Bloom's taxonomy? The third grade teachers at Treasure Forest Elementary School are planning a unit on Thomas Jefferson. They want to challenge their students using higher levels of Bloom's taxonomy, so they're brainstorming ideas to replace their current activities. Which of these requires the highest level of thinking? You know what, let's just order all of these choices from lowest to highest according to Bloom's. Choice A is going to land in either the remember or understand level of Bloom's, depending on the type of question asked, so it's at the bottom. Choice B will come next because it requires students to apply their knowledge. Next, choice D is asking students to analyze their traits compared to Jefferson, so we're getting closer to the top. Choice C is best. This requires students to evaluate the character of Jefferson and to create an original essay. Evaluating and creating are the two highest levels in Bloom's taxonomy. Two categories down, two more to go. Moving on to assessment. Remember when I listed off all those assessment types that you'll need to know? Let's see what you got. Which of the following is an example of a formative assessment? Formative assessments measure learning as it is formed and can help you adjust your lessons to meet your students where they are. So A is the best choice. Using an exit ticket will give a teacher a quick look into how their students are progressing. Like I mentioned before, there are a ton of assessment types. In order to learn all the types you could see on your test, make sure you subscribe to our study guide. Last category, PD, leadership, and community. Let's see a question on collaborating with your teacher peers. Which of the following best promotes professional collaboration and mutual support? Hmm, a lot of these look good, but we can knock out A right away. We love to see some peer tutoring, but that's kiddo collaboration. We need a choice about adults. Now, the three remaining choices could all be considered collaboration, but the key here is mutual support. So while C and D are both great practices, they're probably required by the district. Choice B here is best. In this example, the art teacher is leading a unit that focuses on the same time period that the students are learning about in history class. This shows professional collaboration and mutual support. And that's it, you made it. Congratulations on finishing the video. If you found it helpful, throw us a like. There's still plenty more to learn. Did you know that thousands of teachers have used 240 to help them pass this exam? If you really want to make sure you're prepared for the Praxis Principles of Learning and Teaching grades 5 through 9 exam, take the next step and subscribe to the 240 Study Guide. It has hours of videos, so you can watch and or listen as you please. It's test aligned, so you know precisely what you need to study. And it has hundreds of practice questions, so you can be sure you're ready. And it has that money back guarantee. So click the link below right now to get started. Thank you.